It's kind of funny how all the videos on my YouTube channel seem to be doing on average 200 views. And then there's this one video that kind of blew up and it's titled how ChatGPT works for beginners. And I think it went over 600,000 views. And ever since that became really popular, I guess, uh, people have been reaching out to me on Discord and YouTube asking how I claim to be doing on average about 80% of my programming every day, you know, my work as a software engineer using ChatGPT. Uh, because they haven't had much luck uh, producing like good results from ChatGPT and using that to code. So I decided to sh make this video and also share some thoughts uh, from some people I found online, uh, some bloggers and how they think that we can work with AI in the future as software engineers and how that's going to look like and how they're currently using ChatGPT to do their coding. And I pretty much do the same thing. So. Um, I have two blog posts that I'm going to be covering and I'll share the links in the description and hopefully this video could help you guys um, like make chat GPT help you, uh, you know, cold every day. The first blog post was written by Ken Beck when uh, he wrote the blog post after his tweet got really popular, which was uh, on April 18th. It's probably got probably over 1 million views by now. And what he basically said in the tweet was the value of 90% of uh, my skills just dropped to nothing is worthless. The leverage for the remaining 10% went up by a thousand times. So he needs to rethink how he's going to work in the future. So his blog post was titled 90% of my skills are now worth zero dollars. Um, obviously, it's a bit clickbaity, but yeah, he does talk about how he needs to rethink about uh, how he's going to approach his work. Um, so let's take a look at what he thinks. The blog post uh, doesn't actually talk about what constitutes the 90% of the software development skills that can will go obsolete. So I thought I would quickly just think about that and just write down what I think is going to be obsolete in the pretty you know, near future. So coding tasks, code snippets and filling out functions. So simple coding tasks, it's going to be obsolete. It's already ChatGPT is doing all of that for me. So that is pretty much included in the 80% of my coding. And bug fixes, uh, explain the bug, what happens, and then ChatGPT will be able to read your code, understand it, and try to spot that bug. Generating boilerplate code, when, whenever you're starting a new project or uh, using a library or using a new framework or migrating to a new framework or new version, all of that, ChatGPT will be able to help you with that. Code reviews, uh, pretty obvious. You just copy and paste to ChatGPT and it will give you suggestions in terms of error catching, yeah, exception handling, um, performance improvements, uh, things like that. Technical documentation. This is a huge one for me. Um, I don't, I, I tend to write English pretty badly because uh, it's my second language. So I rely on ChatGPT to generate code comments and also internal documentations for uh, Notion. That's what my team is using. So that's very useful. And of course, generating, te generating the testing code. Uh, so all of these things pretty much, you know, take up most of my day every day as a software developer. Um, other than some high level meetings that I have with product team or other uh, dev team meetings, this is pretty much what I do every day. So this will be all obsolete and the AI should be able to take care of all of this. This point has really caught my eyes when I was reading the blog post and that's technological revolutions proceed by number one, radically reducing the cost of something that used to be expensive. And number two, discovering what is valuable about what has suddenly become cheap. So in terms of software development, I would say the time it takes to complete a project has been reduced and number of engineers that's required to do that project has been reduced. So overall, the cost has gone down. Uh, it will go down quite sub substantially as companies adapt using AI to build software. And what that means is we have to discover some value out of that. If we just sit there and do nothing, then we just become obsolete as software engineers. So what could be valuable out of that? I think. As software engineers, I'm going to cover this later in the later slides as well, but we're going to be doing less of the low level tasks because as mentioned before, AI is going to take care of that. So we'll have to use more time that, that are in our hands to do more high level, more creative, more innovative thinking and more collaboration with other disciplinary teams like UX UI and uh, product teams to put out a more complete uh, like um, product. So it's no longer just you know having a tunnel vision and just trying to pump out code and build something. It's more like uh, building a more high, higher quality and more cohesive product uh, ha by having more meetings and more high level discussions with other team members. Unfortunately, the blog post doesn't really 
discuss what the valuable 10 percent is and that we should be doing 1000 times more so i made this list from a software engineering perspective um, and to overcome some of the limitations that the current ai has so creativity and innovation ai doesn't think outside of the box it just has a much bigger sized box from training data so the current ai was trained with um, a lot of the answers from stack overflow and github repository code and things like that, all that public information. So it does have a much, much bigger sized box than individual software engineer like me. So when it gives suggestions and answers, it would seem for me personally, uh, would be like outside of the box answers, but it's really not outside of the box. It's still, it just means it has bigger sized box. So we still need to rely on, you know, these genius human beings that come once in a while and trigger a paradigm shift in us. Um, that will just completely change the way we think and work. Um, so AI is not going to do that. We still need to rely on human geniuses for that. Complex problem solving. Problems that AI might struggle due to the lack of sufficient data and or understanding of context. So this ties nicely with domain expertise. Ensure AI-driven solutions meet the unique needs and requirements in specific areas. So quite often, we when we work on complex systems, there are nuanced requirements that we need to meet. And AI is going to have a hard time understanding that unless you use something like embeddings API. So I mentioned that in a different video in my channel. But with embeddings API, you can give more context to the AI. But if you're just taking ChatGPT, it's not going to really get to know what you're working on unless you explain it. But then you explain it in text, and then it's going to take up the token limits. So yeah. for for those kind of things, for example, like there's a new regulation that comes up, then you have to refactor your code to accommodate for that. That kind of thing that can be quickly done by a human being, but for AI, you know, you have to wait some time to train it with the new information and things like that. So interdisciplinary collaboration, this basically means let the AI work on lower level stuff and the humans will spend more time doing higher level um, discussions and meetings with other disciplinary teams. And that really keeps everybody in sync so that you can end up with a more higher quality um, software, cohesive and complete systems when you release. System architecture and design, again, this is a complex task, so we have to rely on human beings. AI oversight, provide ethical guidance that align human values, train other humans on how to work with AI, and continuously train AI. So I'm guessing this will be quite possible with a future AI taking care of itself, but for now, we have to focus on that as software engineers. So I did get some DMs of people complaining, I guess, and telling me that ChatGPT is just not good enough for them. Uh, it's giving incorrect answers and they, they're annoyed by it. I understand. Um, but I also agree on this kind of point that the, the author made in, on the, in the blog post. Technological revolution isn't about absolute values, but rather growth rates. So sooner or later, AI will improve faster than humans and surpass. So we shouldn't take it at its current face value, but we should really look at how it's going to grow and get better in the future and the rate at which it's getting better. I mean, from ChatGPT 3.5 to 4 was a quite a leap and I was genuinely like surprised. But for those of you who are complaining right now about how it's not good enough for them, maybe I can help you from uh, with the next slides where I'm gonna be discussing how to do prompt engineering. Like I do that myself and then I also found somebody similar online who, who does it. When you open up a new session on ChatGPT, uh, these are some of the things that you should be doing. Well, I do this right away. So first you need to set the context and uh, give it some basic in instructions that it should follow for the future answers that you're going to be asking. So list the tech stack. So what programming language and what frameworks that you're using. Uh, require the use of the tech stack explicitly. Just tell it to use it. And then also you know, explain the overarching code pattern that you're using in your code base list out important code structure in your code base. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of this later. Uh, list out instructions as to how the tests should be written. So whether that be, I don't know, in TypeScript, let's say, and you're using chest, um, write the test using it rather than test function. Yeah, something as you know silly as that, you can still tell it to follow. And ask it not to generate code. This is pretty important. You don't want it to generate code right away. You need to have high level discussions with it so that you can, you'll, you'll see the, the, the reason behind that. But yeah, it's just basically don't ask it to generate code right away, but instead describe the solution and what it's thinking. Ask it to break down the, the solution as a list of big modules to be built. 
So for example, like I'm looking to build this and this, um, what sort of big modules and components would you build to achieve this? And then the ChatGPT, you know, like make it answer and give you all those components and modules at a high level. Once the context and instructions are prepared, you can use it in every ChatGPT session that you're going to be using. And then also you can share it with your teammates so that they can use it as well. So this is really important. It's just describing your code base to ChatGPT. While you're having this initial conversation or any other conversations later on, um, it's kind of useful to use this prompting trick called reflection. And what that is, is basically you just casually ask ChatGPT to generate some useful information about the problem or about anything that you're talking about. For example, in this case, setting up the stage and making it understand the context and the overall code base and things like that. And you just ask it like, what do you, what do you think it's useful here? What do you think it's um, yeah, important to um, understand and remember? And it'll just give you uh, some list and you can copy and paste and just feed that right back into ChatGPT for, you know, to, to make it um, understand better and give you better answers in the future. Here is an example of the initial prompt that you can do to ChatGPT to give it context and some basic in instructions. This blog post um, is in the description of this video. So here, let's see. The current system is an online whiteboard system. So it's, it's explaining what the system is. Tech stack, all the technologies that are being used and um, the prompt literally says to use the tech stack. And it's explaining the code pattern and VVM. So it looks to me like this is front end code base. And there are two types of this thing called view model. So here we explain the code pattern here. We are explaining the code structure and how we, yeah, structure the, the, the logic. So there seems to be some separation between shared view model and local view model and their purposes and how you, you should use them. Um, it's almost like ex explaining the code base to a new joiner into the team, right? That's interesting. So hooks, um, how we should be naming the hooks and using the hooks and what we shouldn't be doing. Um, and also there's some basic instructions as to how um, ChatGPT should be writing tests. Don't use test, but use describe function. Seems to be just and uh, data driven tests are preferred. You can you can give it you know any kind of testing paradigm like black box testing or whatever. When testing the view component, fake view model. So this is another pattern that they're using in the testing. Yeah, so just instructing ChatGPT. Um, so this person is spending a great deal of uh, time and effort on giving the context and instructing ChatGPT how to answer back. Yeah, so you know, have a read of this. And I think it's a really good example. I don't do to this extent when I talk to ChatGPT, but I think I'm going to start doing it. Next, prompting ChatGPT for implementation strategy. So this is where we start to get a little bit more lower level and try to tackle how we're going to go about writing the code. Take a module and ask ChatGPT to generate a list of specific tasks. So the module here, remember uh, in the last slide, we asked ChatGPT to not generate any code but give us like sort of big picture, like these modules and components that should be built to build build out the whole system. So take a, a one big chunk, um, which is a module and ask it for a list of tasks that we should be doing. Ask ChatGPT to explain its reasoning for, for that breakdown of that list. And such uh, task generation is non-deterministic. So this, this is very critical. Like every time you rerun the prompt, it's going to give you a different list of um, tasks every time. So you have to review the list and pick the one that you like the most. So maybe it'd be a good idea to just copy and paste and have multiple copies. Review the list of tasks. Um, ask it to rewrite some tasks. If you don't like, uh, like out of all the things that it gave you in the list, pick one that you don't like and ask it to rewrite it and rewrite the plan by grouping them as certain parts of the architectural design. So this is basically saying, right, we've got a, a list of tasks that we need to do, but can you now divide them and group them into um, like kind of groupings that fit the architectural design? If you have such an architectural design, then it's going to help you create those dev tickets easier. So that's one optimization you can do and ask it to rewrite the tasks with specific component class function names. So this is another iteration that you can do on top of the initial list that it gives you. So yeah. 
uh, in the beginning, it's going to just give you like a very concise um, list, but then you can you know improve on that and ask it to be more specific so that you don't even have to think about what function names or uh, component names that, that you should be writing. It, it can just give it to you. Going back to the example from the blog post, remember we had this person creating this or building this online whiteboard system. And as part of that system, there seems to be this awareness layer feature. So this is a module and component that I was talking about. You really want to ask ChatGPT to create a list of tasks for a specific module or a big piece in the system. So in this case, we're working on awareness layer. And these are the tasks, create new component, create new layer, conva layer, create a new Redux slice. So it's going into more kind of a lower level code. So it's giving you very specific like things that you need to code, which is good. So it gives you that list of tasks for that particular module. So here the plan comes back to you. And then you ask it to rewrite it using detailed component names and methods and props. So it's even designing the props for you in the case of uh, front end development. So it's basically made all those individual tasks more specific and more detailed. Uh, and then it's writing code. So I think this is a pretty good kind of a way to iterate and improve on the initial list of tasks. Next, it's pretty straightforward. Now it's time to just generate code. And for each task, that's now by this time, it should be granular and pretty small, bite-sized. And uh, you ask it to do test-driven approach. So ask it to generate the testing code first and then code the actual functions or implementation second. Review everything that was generated and you just iterate on it. And you actually, um, I encourage you to run the test and see if everything makes sense. Quite often you'll see that the tests are failing. So, but at least the tests are decent and you can, you have something to improve upon and it saves you a lot of time. So I definitely recommend doing it this way. So before you run off and start building your dream app uh, using this new way of working with ChatGPT, there are some caveats, unfortunately. So the biggest problem is the token limit which you know limits ChatGPT um, of the amount of context it can hold within a single session. So once the limit is hit, you're gonna see some weird stuff happening with ChatGPT. The session might just run into fatal error and just crash, in which case you have to refresh and revive the session. And then you, even after you do that, ChatGPT can start to forget stuff that you talked about in the past. So what you have to do is you have to re-educate it. So this is why it's important to do that high level discussion in the beginning without telling it to generate the code right away, you just tell it, you know, all those in, all those instructions and context and everything and have that, you know, high level conversation with ChatGPT in the beginning so that you can copy and paste later when it starts to forget stuff. So yeah, that's a quick way to like bring it back up to speed. So this is it. Um, I hope uh, this was helpful and you guys will have fun working with ChatGPT.